We're on part 44 of understanding the kingdom. And I, I think it's interesting that we're dealing with the fruit of the Spirit. And really having the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives is essential if we're going to learn to walk in kingdom because everything of the kingdom of God responds to the nature of God. And, if they, and if, so the, the power of God and the presence of God and all these things will not flow where his character is not established. When we, when we eventually we get into the armor, we, we're going to find we have a lot of Christians that are running around on the battlefield in their BVDs thinking that they're in this big Sherman tank because the armor of God, of God, will not, cannot be established where the character of Christ is not established. And I think it's interesting this week that as I was studying this, I got an email from one of our partners that said, you better check your YouTube feed. And uh, we have over 300 videos. I never check it. I barely have time to upload what we're uploading. And uh, there were some comments that were so nasty that other partners were reporting them to Google and getting them kicked off and different things. And, and uh, people, you know, I, I just figured people would be civil. And uh, I've, listened, I've listened to YouTube videos. Mary's listened to YouTube videos. Some have been great. Some of them, the, after they said, hello, I'm so-and-so and this is my name, I didn't agree with a thing they said after that. But I've never felt compelled to put a comment or start an argument or this kind of thing. Uh, I figure if I didn't pay for it, I don't have a right to say anything about it. Well, it doesn't seem like it's that way. And uh, people picking arguments, picking fights, trying to goad, or maybe I touched one of their sacred cows or whatever. And, uh, and so I reached out to some people this week that uh, are a bigger ministry than I am, and they said, well, listen, if you ever respond to one of them, it, they will absolutely suck up every bit of your time because they don't, want, they don't want to do anything except argue. And so I tested it. One guy wrote something, you know, about the, the mixed, you know, you know, how come, you know, if you don't eat pork, how come you're wearing mixed clothing? And so I shared the truth about how the Hebrew is and that is specific with linen made from flax and wool and how that science has discovered it'll create a static field around you that will cause chronic fatigue syndrome. Even though it was very popular in the time that the Torah was written, the pagans were wearing this. God said, listen, you're going to need strength. Don't do this. And so I put all that in. And the next thing you know, I get this barrage of responses. I mean, he threw everything to include the Davidic compound with Koresh down in Texas. And how that had to do with pork, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and it... And so I, I thought, well, I'm just going to share the wisdom of my elders. And we ended up turning off the being able to do comments on our YouTube because Christians can act civil. And it, I think part of the te technology and the anonymity of, of different things, it's really showing us what is there when, you know, people, you know, I'm, I'm old school. I was raised in church just about, and people put on this face when they go to church and then they take it off and put it in their glove compartment when they get back in their car and they go home. Well, the internet has revealed the true face of much of Christianity. That it, there, 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 are, there is no fruit of the Holy Spirit. And many of them, now, there's a, I mean, and I'm talking about 5 to 10% of the people that left comments. Some, there were so many wonderful comments on there, but uh, because of abuse, you just simply need to turn it off. And uh, I, I thought it, it's interesting as I'm sitting here studying the fruit of the Holy Spirit, how that uh, it was brought to my attention, the lack thereof amongst those that say they follow Christ. And I, I've got a whole bunch of preachers that I don't agree with a lot of things. I never feel compelled to write them about it. I never feel, I never put comments and everything. What do you do? You quit watching and you go on to something that speaks to you where you're at but not in today's age. Uh, also, I've had several people email me and ask about good resources on studying the fruit of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite books is A Call to Character by Greg Zoshak, and I'm not sure if it's still in print or not. And Greg, if you're watching, it needs to be in print. Create Space is a great way to put it there and get it back in Kindle because it really was, was, was a good book. But there are many on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and it's not taught anymore. 
because you cannot have a carnal church and teach them about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They're incompatible. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22. Now, any time you see law in either the Old Testament or New Testament, it is derived from the word Torah, which means loving instruction of the Father. It does not mean law, like if you go out here and you go 55 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone and you broke the law, there is, there is a difference. Although hopefully most of the time the government wants to do things to keep people from getting hurt, that's why they spe set speed limits. But Torah means to be able to hit the mark, be able to reach the goal of, of walking with God and to, and to live a life that is pleasing to God. And so with that in mind, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against there is no such law or against there is no instruction from God forbidding it. In fact, when you read the Torah, and Jesus quotes it when he was asked, what are the greatest of all the commandments? And really it was a loaded question. They, uh, they, many times the Pharisees would try to trip him up, and you know, somebody that's had a whole lot stolen from him, he would say, well, the greatest commandments, thou shalt not steal. Or someone, if their maid had committed adultery, well, the, you know, the greatest commandment is not because you, you tend to personalize it. And so they were kind of waiting for him to jump on one of those so that they could say, ah, ah, no, 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 it's this one. But when he responded, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and there's one like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and all the instruction of God and the prophets, the Torah and the prophets, hinge on this truth, it silenced all of them. For one thing, if you really loved your neighbor as yourself, you wouldn't ask him a question trying to load him to do a one-upmanship to get another notch in the public, would you? Nor if he said he was trying to teach you the things of God, would you disrespect God by trying to do what they had done? And so it, it brought it together. And so in all the Torah, these two truths, in fact, it's part of the Shema on, on the God part. Hear, O Israel, the, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It was a watchword of Israel, so much a watchword of Israel that even as the Nazis marched the Jewish people into the consecration camps and to their death, they were reciting the Shema. I tell you what, that, that, that's a hard... They were, they were not going to deny the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, no matter what. Last week, we dealt with love and joy. I want to deal with one today, the next one, peace. That it seems like everybody's looking for. And what, what's strange is there are so many in the church searching for peace when peace is a product of abiding in Him. It, it, it should be as natural to us as breathing, but yet we do everything but abide in Him. Peace. Now in the Greek it means a state, of, I love the first one, a state of national tranquility. Does that not describe the kingdom? A state of national tranquility. Exemption from the rage and havoc of war. Peace between individuals, harmony, accord, security, safety, prosperity, felicity. Of Messiah's peace, the way that leads to peace, salvation of Christianity. The tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ and so fearing nothing from God and content with its earthly lot of whatsoever sort that is, the blessed state of devout and upright men after death. 
There's something about peace, the, the, the whole concept of peace. Now, in Hebrew, the, the corresponding word in Hebrew would be shalom. So much so that Hebraically in Jesus' day when they, when they met, you know, it's kind of like aloha when you go to, to Hawaii. It's, it's the old joke, when you go to Hawaii, you never know if you're coming or going because it's aloha when they see you and aloha when you leave. Well, it's the same thing. It's, it's shalom. But shalom means more than peace. It literally means a full manifestation of the salvation of God in your life that includes healing, deliverance, prosperity, all these things of having peace within. That is available to us when we learn to abide. And there's no other way to get it rather, other than your prayer closet. In your prayer time, the more you know the Prince of Peace, the more peace you have. You can't bottle it. You can't line people up in a church and lay hands on them and give them peace. Peace is drawn from relationship. Now, I love what it talks about, and this is from the Preacher's Sermon and Outline Bible, and I've been quoting from it for quite a bit because what the Preacher's Sermon and Outline Bible does over a lot of classic Protestant evangelical writings, whether it's McClintock and Strong, McEachern, so many of them, they, they amalgamate them together into a single source and bring the best out of all of them. And so I'm going to bring here what it, what it says here about the fruit of peace or the aspect of peace within the fruit. There is a fruit of peace. It binds, it means to bind together, to join, to weave together. It means that the person is bound, woven, and joined together with himself and with God and with others. It's like the zitzi on the end of the, of the prayer shawl, that blue cord, the only way that you can walk in the kingdom and walk in the commandments is Messiah has to be intertwined into every bit of it. That the peace comes from intertwining with God. In fact, Mary and I, you know, even in the state of marriage, you have more peace as your, as your lives begin to be knit together and woven together and you begin to find harmony with one another it brings peace to a household, doesn't it? Same concept. Going on with the preacher's sermon outline Bible, the word, the Hebrew word is shalom. It means freedom from trouble and much more. It means experiencing the highest good, enjoying the very best possible, uh, possessing all the inner good possible. It means wholeness and soundness. It means prosperity in the widest sense, especially prosperity in the spiritual sense of having a soul that blossoms and flourishes. I like that. Then it goes on to say there is the peace of the world, uh, this peace of escapism, of avoiding trouble, of refusing to face things, of unreality. It is the peace sought through pleasure, satisfaction, contentment, the absence of trouble, positive thinking, or denial of problems. That's the world's way of peace. And there is a peace of Christ and of God. The peace of God is first a blossom peace, a, a peace deep within. It is a tranquility of mind, of composure, and restfulness that is undisturbed by circumstances and situations. It is more than feeling, even more than attitude and thought. The peace of God is second, the peace of conquest. It is the peace that is independent of conditions and environment, the peace which knows no sorrow, danger, suffering, or experience can take away. So the, key, the peace of the kingdom of God is not situational. The peace can manifest in the midst of the storm. So when Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, gives I unto you, it is the same as when he, sh he showed up in the middle of the storm and said, peace be still. When we're intertwined with him, Jesus always shows up. And because I'm right with him, circumstances around me never changes that peace. Peace. 
fact, they go on to quote John 16, 33, And these things I speak unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I'm walking with the one that the world even tried to kill, and he rose from the dead. What can you do to a man rose from the dead? He already conquered death, hell, and the grave. What can you do? And I'm walking with him. The peace of God is third, the peace of assurance. It is the peace of an unquestionable confidence. The peace with the knowledge that one's life is in the hands of God and that all things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, which is taken from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The peace of God is fourth, the peace of intimacy with God. And this, this is the essential. You want more peace, you got to go deeper in God. It's the only way to get it. The kind of peace that we're talking about, the fruit of the Spirit, the more you know Him, the more you'll begin experiencing these things. It is the peace of the highest good. It is the peace that settles the mind and strengthens the will and establishes the heart. That's the kind of peace we're looking for. There is a source of peace. Peace is always born out of reconciliation. Its source is found only in the reconciliation wrought by Jesus Christ. Peace always has to do with personal relationships, a man's relationship to himself, to God, and to his fellow man. The man must be bound, woven together with himself in order to have peace. A man must be bound, woven, and joined together with God in order to have peace. And a man must be bound, woven together, and joined with his fellow man to have peace. There's peace within, there's peace without. How many know we've got to have that? And so this is a call when we begin talking, and, and the, the powerful thing about all this, it, it is learning to fellowship with the king of the kingdom, because I have this deep relationship with him. It doesn't matter what this other kingdom is doing, I walk in a greater kingdom. And as long as there's nothing come between he and I, like sin, when you allow sin in your life, it begins to, it, your, your, your peace begins to wane because the reconciliation is not fully intact because there's something between you and between Him. And I love what the New International Greek Testament commentary says here because it, it, it brings in this peace concept. One could well believe that love, joy, and peace form a triad in early Christian language like faith, hope, and love. In the upper room discord of the fourth gospel, Jesus describes his disciples, or he gives his disciples, my peace, John 4, 27, bids them abide in my love, John 15, 9, and desires that they know my joy in John 15, 11. So much the same way, the very first things that begin to develop out of this relationship with Almighty God, of being reconciled to God, is you're going to have love, joy, and peace. It can only come out of relationship. And so if you don't have peace, the first thing that we need to begin asking is what is between me and God that has not been covered in the blood? Am I trying to seek the world's peace by trying to avoid rather than hitting things head on? The next thing I want to cover is long-suffering. Long-suffering in the Greek means patience, endurance, perseverance, forbearance, slowness, and avenging wrongs. But one of the things I really like here in this definition consistency and steadfastness there is something about long suffering that causes us no matter what's going on in our life you're always the same the more that if 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 our hope 
the anchor of our soul is established in Christ, I, I, I'm not back and forth all over the place. The more I know Him and who I am in Him and how that my future is established in Him, my presence is guarded by Him, my past is under His blood, I, I, I don't have to respond like men would to every situation. I can have long-suffering. And, and God is our example. Do you know why the earth is not a grease spot? The long-suffering of God. Why has Jesus not come back yet? The long-suffering of God. Come on now. Why aren't you a grease spot? The long-suffering of God. How many know most, most of us, it has been a journey to faithfulness in Him. And while we were yet sinners, it was the grace of God and the long-suffering of God that brought us to repentance and God knew it would be a journey to get us there therefore as I deal with my fellow man I have long suffering now that long suffering literally also talks about slowness in avenging wrongs now it doesn't mean that I've got to put up with you always in my face people forget the difference about asking forgiveness and reconciliation You see, the, this whole thing of, of even walking in the peace of God, it's reconciliation. You have to say, I'm sorry, and I was wrong. I know I've heard in the past many Christians flippantly say, yeah, but you got to forgive me. Yeah, but that doesn't mean there's going to be reconciliation. I can long suffer you from afar. Especially if someone's toxic, you don't want them around your family and a lot of different things. But it doesn't mean I'm going to hunt you down and settle the discussion with the baseball bat either. It means I pray for you, tolerate you from afar, and pray that God would bring you to repentance and that He would manifest His grace in you. And hopefully one day that happens where you come and you say, forgive me, I was wrong. Now, I know the old joke is there's two things that men have great difficulty saying. I don't know, and I was wrong. But there's grace to overcome that in a man's life. I want to look here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9 through 11. Talking about long-suffering because there are things, you know, we've had people that have <clears throat> preach faith that if you have enough faith, you're never going to go through anything. Well, then you're never going to have long suffering, are you? You don't need it. But let's see what Paul shares here in, in Colossians chapter 9, or verse 1, or chapter 1, starting in verse 9. Now, this he's sharing with those in Colossia that he has heard of their faith of coming to Messiah. And he says, for this cause also since the day that I heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that ye may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now in verse 10, underline this, that you might walk worthy of the Lord. That's, that is something the body of Christ has completely lost and we have used grace as an excuse not to. That in other words, what Paul was saying, that which grace has done within you, that it would begin manifesting through you so that you could walk in a manner that is not only worthy of God, but would also bring Him glory, bring Him honor. That you might walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now that's, that all sounds wonderful, doesn't it? But he doesn't stop there. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. And I really wish he would have stopped there. But he didn't. Most Christians wish he would have stopped there. With all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. But he, he didn't get to the need for patience and long suffering until he covered 
increasing in the knowledge of God and being strengthened with might according to his glorious power. It's his might in you and his glorious power that allows you to have patience and long-suffering in the midst of tribulation. In the American westernized world, we have lost sight of that. Many other parts of the world, they have not, because tribulation is a constant companion. And there are many scriptures in the New Testament, both written by the Apostle Paul and Peter, that tribulation has its work, as it worketh patience. And patience, long-suffering, long-suffering faith. It begins working these things out in our lives. We need to learn, and let me tell you something, what I have learned personally, the more that I have long-suffering with myself, because I know that I have been accepted in Christ. All of us have a past, and sometimes the, the one that you need to have the greatest patience with is yourself. Uh, I, was, I was editing the last session, and, you know, with, with dealing with everything here at the building, there was a lot of plumbing. There were a lot of faucets. As soon as we get everything done and we get home and Mary and I are talking about how good it's going to be to relax, and immediately the kitchen faucet had to be replaced and sink and many trips back and forth to Lowe's, which is like an hour trip back and forth because, some, you know, when you get into old plumbing, I looked back there and I thought, my word, this is a plumber's nightmare. And it still kind of is, but at least it's functional. And so I'm talking about the facets of a diamond. And in the video, I said faucets. And so, I, I, and so you learn to, when you, when you have a gaff like that, you learn to joke and just go on. Because what the enemy wants you to do is nitpick. And you will nitpick yourself quicker than you'll nitpick anybody else. But when you realize that you're a work in progress, none of us are perfect. I know a lot of other ministries will go through and they'll actually redub over a lot of things or cut a lot of things out. Every once in a while I'll, I'll cut something out, but usually when it's just a gaff like that, I'll leave it in because I'm human. I know it may cause a flurry on the internet to realize that somebody who's preaching the gospel is actually human, and we're not these plastic, you know, these cardboard things that Hollywood has caused us to expect. But once, we, once I have that inner peace, and I have long-suffering with myself, I have greater patience and long-suffering with others. I can have greater long-suffering in the midst of the journey. And so if Jesus loved you, and he forgave you, and he's patiently working on your life to get you where you need to be, you need to do the same thing for yourself. Some people read the scriptures where God says, you know, I am holy, be thou holy. When you look it up in the Greek, it's, uh, it's teleos or some der derivation depending upon uh, the verse you're looking at, which can be, trans can be translated perfect, but it means to be mature. Be thou perfect. Be mature. It talks about someone who's, you, 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 have, you have children that, that don't know how to control their emotions or control situations. And, and uh, how do you know when a, little, when a little kid, when he's mad, you know he's mad. Many times when you walk into Walmart, the whole store knows they're mad. But you, sometimes you expect that of a little child because they're still learning. Now, if it's a 50-year-old man in Walmart, and they're doing the same thing, then something's out of order, isn't it? Because you have, had expected them to mature, to where you bring things under control better. So we're all in this process of maturing, and God says, listen, the goal is to mature. And God's calling us to do that. Let's look at the next one, gentleness. Moral goodness, integrity, kindness. I think the one that stuck out with me most about this, I was looking at Dake's notes. 
And gentleness, he says, a disposition to be gentle, soft-spoken, kind, even-tempered. But his next few words really caught my eye. Cultured and refined in character and conduct. Cultured. You don't see that on the internet very often, do you? <laughs> I know that I, you know, we've, we've got to talk with people like Henry Groover. We've had the privilege of fellowshipping with great pastors like Dr. John Looper and others. And uh, I've seen him disagree with folks. And he'll smile and he'll have love in his eyes. He said... We'll talk about this in depth a little bit more later on. And he'll patiently sit and open up the word. And sometimes you're looking at things from two different positions. And sometimes you can be completely out in left field. But he approaches those situations and those that the character of Christ has really been established. And I mean, this, this, this one really hit me, the gentleness part, because sometimes Mike Lake can really get ornery. Okay, especially if it's been a long day. Cultured and refined in character. Christ likeness. That doesn't mean there may not be a time to overturn the money changers' tables, but you don't turn overturn the money changers' tables because your coffee got cold. Okay. We have to learn to respond through the lens of Christ and the life of Christ and what he did. And I think that if there was ever a time for the body of Christ to be even-tempered, cultured, and refined in character and conduct, it's today, it's so lacking. You see, the world's watching. The world's watching about how we have disagreements. The world's watching all the social media feed. I have seen on Facebook Christians get into this long, long discussion, and maybe in their in their friend, one of the friends of one of them had somebody that wasn't a Christian, and I've and I've seen the response. You guys are why I never go to church. So your argument, your lack of culture. Your lack of refineness and character may have just stopped somebody from receiving the Lord and hearing the truth of the gospel or postponed it, maybe for decades. I know years ago, I had been asked to, to go and minister to a guy, and he didn't want to hear anything about church or the gospel because of what some Christian did to him. And, and he went to his grave that way. Guys, did he not see Christ in that situation? Or did he see religiousness and a vicious religious spirit that he didn't want any part of? The way we conduct ourselves on the internet, in person, in a letter... I'm, this, this is challenging to me because I want to make sure, you know, as I put this together this morning, I said, Lord, Mike Lake needs some cultured. I need, I need to be cultured a little bit more. I need to be refined a little bit more. I need to step back and, and think, how would Jesus handle this situation? Because there's, there's more rough edges all of us, that as we have this relationship with Christ, it's like being washed in the water of the Word, that it's in, it's in that, that washing and sometimes bumping together with others, just like rocks in a brook. That's how you end up with smooth rocks at the hand of God. The last one I want to deal with today, and this one I think is very important, is faith. Now, I've heard preachers talk, you know, you know, faith in God and faith to move mountains is so important, it's both a fruit and a gift. But I think when you look at it in the context of the fruit, it's not faith that God can move mountains. 
And everybody goes, what? It's not. When we look at all of the definitions that this Greek word can be, it can talk about conviction of the truth of anything, belief, in New Testament of conviction or belief, respecting man's relationship to God, of divine things generally, which in, includes the idea of trust and holy fervor born to faith and joining with in relationship to God. But when you look at it in context, it actually goes down to the second level meaning of this Greek word. Fidelity, faithfulness, the character of of one who can be relied upon. It's the same as when Habakkuk said, the just shall live by faith, and it was quoted by the Apostle Paul, that because of what God has wrought in me because of His grace, my response is fidelity to the kingdom. In fact, in the New American Standard Bible, it translates this, as the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The more you know the King, the more faithful you will be to Him. Come on. In fact, when I looked in BDAG, which is the acronym for the uh, Greek le English lexicon of the New Testament and other Christian literature, this is what it translates as that which invokes trust and faith. The state of being someone in whom confidence can be placed, faithfulness, reliability, fidelity, commitment. You see, I think one of the things that every pastor on the planet, especially within the Western world, would wish is that the fruit of faith would be established in those within their congregation. Because pastors are promised everything under the sun and the moon. God's called me to this. Next week, no, God's called me to this. Next week, no, forget about all that. God's called me to this. Well, pastor, you can always trust me, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep your back, and it's usually the very one who sticks the dagger in his back. One of the, one of the biggest complaints of, from pastors today in America is they're lonely. They have no one that they can trust. And it doesn't matter if they pastor 10 or 10,000. It's the same complaint. And I think many times the lack of fidelity that we show to those in ministry is simply another manifestation of that which we're showing the Savior. Many, many times. Now, yeah, there are times that pastors mess up because they're human just like everybody else. But that doesn't mean that you go take the pastor and throw him under the bus. You realize he's human just like I am. And he's trying his best just like I am. If Christians would take the time that they gripe about men in ministry and start praying for men in ministry, we'd turn the world upside down. But Jesus even challenges us here, and I, I want to end with this. This is found in Luke chapter 18. Verses 6 through 8, and in fact, I've, I've recently, Mary and I did a podcast about this, and it's the parable of the unjust judge, and how that prayer feels like this many times. You know, this, this woman had a situation where people had wronged her. She was a widow. She had no one to avenge her, so she kept going to this unjust judge, and he didn't want to be bothered with it. He didn't care what the law was or what the right thing to do was, but because she kept coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back, he finally said, i got to shut this old woman up. I'm going to go ahead and give her justice. And Jesus was saying, listen, there are times because of God's long suffering with the world that we may feel like he's the unjust judge when he's actually showing long suffering, that he hasn't enacted justice. And at the same time, that tribulation in our life works patience. And so, he, so that's, that's really the parable. In fact, Jesus began that parable by saying, men ought always to pray and not faint. One of the translations, I can't remember if it's Wyman's translation, says, are turn coward. Did not faint or turn coward. 
But he ends this parable with this, and this picks up in verse 6. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjudged just saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, who which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. Why? Because of his long suffering to sinful humanity, so that, that he can bring in the harvest. But then Jesus poses this question, and I tell you he will avenge them speedily. So when he actually does move, how many know in the book of Revelation, the seven years of tribulation compared to all of human history is a fast act? And it comes suddenly. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth? So Jesus is posting a question. Are we going to let the world affect us? Are we going to have the fruit of that relationship with our king that no matter even if he's long-suffering with a sinful world, that he, and in fact, this is the exact same Greek word, and when you look back at Bedak, it, it brings it down to this clause, will he find faithfulness in the earth? Will he find those that are faithful to him no matter what they go through? I was appalled in the last few years in the war in Syria that you had jihadists as well as those within the intelligence community fueling it, that they were wiping out Christian communities, and that these Christians were given the chance to deny Christ. And their very last words were they cried out the name of of him whom they had believed in. They refused even with the threat of death to deny Christ. Now let me tell you, let me ask you, is that faithfulness? Is that faithfulness? Absolutely. And yet men in America because they threw God a tip in the offering plate and God didn't make them a millionaire, have walked away from the one who shed his blood to redeem their soul. I think Jesus wasn't kidding because I, well, and during, between now and the Lord comes back, we're going to have to go through some things. Even, even those with the pre-tribulation, pre-trib rapture doctrine, it used to be, Come accept Jesus and you won't have to go through anything. They quit doing that. They're saying, we're going to have to go through some stuff. And it might even need to be preppers because we don't know how bad it's going to be before the Lord comes back. And this isn't debate whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. That's, that's not the point of this. As it is, some of this, I think, was, was founded out of our Western culture of affluence. The early apostles had to go through stuff. And if there ever had anybody that really understood faith that was taught by Jesus and should overcome it all, if it's, if it's going to be that way and never have another problem in their life, wouldn't it have been the apostles that were personally taught by Jesus for three and a half years? Sometimes we, we let our own culture come in. And the thing is, we need to have fidelity. We need to become, if you will, Marines in the kingdom of God. In the Marine Corps, they have an expression, Semper Fi, which means always faithful. Always faithful. We need to be always faithful to the, our king no matter what we go through. Knowing that our lives are in his hands. And it may be the long suffering for salvation of someone else. He's letting the situation stand. But we trust him. And we will be faithful to him regardless of anything that this world does. That's what he's looking for. That's why the just shall live by faithfulness. He will live to his fidelity to the covenant. Will give him life and help him live in the midst of a perverse world. And if there was ever a time that we need to have that faithfulness in our lives, it is today. Lord, may we trust you. May we have faith in you. 
And may we prove ourselves to be faithful to the throne of God, the Word of God, and the kingdom of God. And we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.